أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين We're getting closer and closer to the end of these 10 nights. Alhamdulillah, we've covered much ground. The purpose of these talks, as I've said before, were to get us a little more familiar with how it works when it comes to certain details, figuring them out based on the Quran, based on the ahadith, and how when we are told to rely on those fundamentals, those bunkers that I called it, what is meant by relying on them? I was just trying to, over these nights, get across that, how it works when we can't figure out certain details at one, one hand, we can't figure them out regarding God, regarding what He does, his judgments, and so on. We can't figure them out, but at least we have those general concepts that Islam has taught us so that we can at least fall back on those when we get stuck. Lots of times we can't figure stuff out. We get stuck. And if we don't figure it out, we, 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 we start questioning. No. I'm trying to just give a taste of how they can be solved. They can be solved so that if, brothers and sisters, after these majalis, other questions come to our mind. Just last night or two nights ago, a brother sat down with me and asked me another question. I said, this is also a good question that can be covered. We don't have time for it. But even if you're not able to solve it, brothers and sisters, at least you have something to fall back on. I try to mention questions that sometimes we feel are insolvable. We can't solve them. So let's put our trust in Allah and you know just fall back on our bunkers. But I try to give a taste of how they can be solved. But just because we can't solve them, let's trust those bunkers that Islam has given us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, I am just, I am just, I am just. So if I get stuck and this question comes that I have a good non-Muslim friend, does that mean that he's going to go to hell for sure? It doesn't read with Allah's justice. Okay, if we weren't in these lectures, for example, what are we supposed to do? Supposed to start questioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. We can rely on those bunkers. Why? Because we, were, we gave some examples of how they can be solved. They can be solved. This question that is eating at my mind, it can be solved. So if in the future, brothers and sisters, other questions come up, at least we say to ourselves that, yeah, look, we had some examples of how they were solved, the ones that we thought can't be. So these also probably can be solved, relying on the bunkers, and so on. This is, the, this is what I was trying to get across. Inshallah, I was able to, 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 to an extent, get this across, inshallah. Another point, another question, another problem that we have. Now, we're moving on. We were super theoretical before this. We're going to move on a little bit now and get a little more practical tonight, tomorrow night, the day after tomorrow night. We're going to try to make it a little more practical now. Some of those things that we've learned, we're going to put them to practice. See how they work when it comes to our practice in amal. We have a question that's always out there. I get, I've gotten this question so many times. It's a famous question. And inshallah, after tonight and probably tomorrow night, it'll probably go into tomorrow night too, this discussion. We'll see that it's not the way we usually are told. It's not usually the, usually the way we think when it comes to the answer of this question. What's the question? The question goes like this. 
I'm going to have to start introduction again. These nights, if you paid attention, we're always talking about taqwa, taqwa, wajib haram, wajib haram, those things that we always underestimate. Those are what, what cause our growth, spiritual growth. Ubudiya, servitude, and so on. We've been talking about this. Okay, that was something in general. The question stems out of this principle of taqwa being everything. And that is, sometimes I commit something haram, but I didn't know it's haram. Will it have an effect on my spirituality or not? This is the question. This question is always out there. I don't know if some of you have had this question before or not. But this is a question many people have. If I unwillingly, unknowingly commit haram, will it have an effect on my spirituality or not? What's the answer we usually get? Yes, it does have an effect on your spirituality. I'm not saying this is true. I'm not saying this is false. Let's go through our principles that the Qur'an gives us after establishing once again our foundations we will go and dissect this topic in specific inshallah this is the question and of course there's different types of committing haram that I will touch on inshallah either tonight or if I don't get the chance inshallah tomorrow night recite a salawat please So the question is, will it have an effect on my spirituality? Will committing haram have an effect on my spirituality if it is done unwillingly? So we have different parts in this question. We have spirituality. We have haram. And we have, will it have an effect unwillingly if I do it? Two or three parts here we have to first decide on understand what we're talking about exactly, and then move on. I'm going to start with spirituality. Will it have an effect on my spirituality? Question, what do you see as spirituality? This concept today that everyone's talking about. Why? Because humanity has sunk so low, you can actually hear the sounds outside right now of what they're doing. Man wants a way out of this. That's why lots of people are turning towards different forms of spirituality. Finding the self. Doing yoga. I don't know. Anything. Anything that will save them from this darkness. What do you define as spirituality? If you want to see if it has an effect on your spirituality, let's see what spirituality is and then. Brothers and sisters, there is like a million definitions for spirituality that people have. Everyone has their own definition. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're non-Muslim, whether you are in the, from the Irfani school and you have the Irfani approach, the mystical approach to things, or no, you have a more literal approach to things. It doesn't matter. Everyone has their own definition. Personally, I think we should go to the Quran or even, let's not even go to the Qur'an. Let's think about it ourselves. Spirituality means what? That means you are gaining transcendence. What does that mean? That means you're getting closer to Him. Personally, I like to define spirituality like this. Of course, this comes from a hadith and Qur'an. The more spiritual one is, the more they are closer to Allah. If that is what the ultimate goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The closer I get, what does that mean? The more spiritual I am. But Mulana, we've heard stories. We've heard stories about how there are spiritual people that they do certain magical things. Extraordinary things. They are able to, 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 to travel long distances, but in short times. Huh? They're able to see through walls. When they pray, 
they have a spiritual high, good feeling, they take pleasure. Some of these brothers and sisters are signs of spirituality, but they're not spirituality themselves, itself. It's not. There's a difference between a sign of something and that thing itself. There's a big difference. Theoretically speaking, there's a big difference. We don't want to mix these two up. Spirituality means being close to Him. The closer, the more spiritual. Yes, the closer you get, yes, you might, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might give certain permission to you to do certain things in this life. I don't know. But being able to do extraordinary things, is that spirituality? No. Taking pleasure in the salat even isn't the definition of spirituality. It's a sign. Because there are some who might even be far away from Allah. But every now and then they'll get a special feeling in their salat. There are people who are able to travel long distances even though they're not even Muslim. Hindu gurus, for God's sake, they can do lots of things that normal Muslims can't do. Does that mean that that is the, that is the path to spirituality? No. So you see, sometimes the signs can be found elsewhere, but the definition, that's not what defines it. Spirituality equals closeness to Him. That's it. Even if you don't have any of these things, spirituality means closeness to Him. Okay, so if that's the spirituality, how do I gain closeness to Allah? How do I get His attention? How do I let Him know I love Him? So that He allows me to get closer to Him. Let's do three verses of the Qur'an. The first verse, Surah Yasin, verse 61. وَأَنِعْبُدُونِي هَذَا صِرَاطٌ مُسْتَقِيمٌ أُعْبُدُونِي Serve me, obey me. هَذَا صِرَاطٌ مُسْتَقِيمٌ This is the Sirat al-Mustaqim. So someone will say, we're after spirituality, and we said spirituality equals God, Allah, the Lord. This verse is saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this verse is saying, the straight path has to do with servitude. Servitude equals straight path. It doesn't equal Lord. We say there's another verse in the Quran that says that Lord that you're trying to get to He's on that straight path. Inna Rabbi, another verse. Ala siratin mustaqim. Put the verses together, it makes perfect sense. If spirituality equals Allah, there is a proxy to Allah. If you want to get to Allah, you have to be on sirat al mustaqim because Allah in the Quran says, I'm on this sirat al mustaqim. How do I get on it? Ani'buduni hada sirat al mustaqim. This is the sirat al mustaqim. So, spirituality, which is Allah, has criteria. The criterion is ubuduni, ubudiya, servitude. Nothing else. This verse doesn't say anything else. Servitude. That's it. Next verse. So, what do what do we get out of the first verse? Spirituality equals Allah. If I want Allah, which is spirituality, criteria. According to this verse, criteria, ubudiyah. Next verse. Surah Dhariyat, verse 56. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I created jinn and man only for one purpose. لِيَعْبُدُونَ Are you seeing a pattern here or is it just me? There it was, U'buduni hadha siratun mustaqim. Here it says, I created you for one purpose. Liya'budun, same root word. This is what it is. Your purpose was to come back to me. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Right? If Allah is the purpose, here he's saying, Ubudiya is the purpose. What does that mean? That means, Ubudiya is going to get you there. Those people who say this verse, what it is trying to say is, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْرِفُونَ 
Because yeah, ma'rifatullah, reaching Allah, all of this is the ultimate, ultimate goal. But in the verse, Allah is telling you, I created you for servitude because servitude gets you to me. Please pay attention. Allah is telling you the means. Of course, the ultimate goal of creation isn't to serve God. What is He getting out of it? When you serve Allah, the capacity grows, as I said last night. The more obedience, the more capacity. To gain, to receive the light from Him. So this verse also is telling us the criteria for reaching Him, which is spirituality, is once again, the same root word. Third verse, Surah Hujurat, verse 13. It's a, long, it's a little longer. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ In this verse, Allah says, we created you from male and female. Those who say, Islam is a sexist religion. No. Islam says when it comes to the purpose of creation, there is no difference between man and woman. If Allah had said a difference between man and woman when it comes to the purpose of creation, we had a problem with that. Other than the purpose of creation, Allah says it's not that important. But for the materialists, this is all in parentheses by the way, the materialist approach and perspective says even in this, this life even holds uh, precedence and is important. We should even be equal in this life when it comes to certain rulings and so on. No, we were created differently, different rulings will apply. Whenever you materialists have a football match where one side is a man team and the other side is a woman team and they're playing against each other, then I will have a di I'll change my mind regarding Islam's approach. There's a difference even in the, in, the, in the creation of man and woman. How come they never have a football, football match against each other? And even if they do, it's just you know out of fun or whatever. It's not a real football match that counts because there's a difference. They'll laugh at you. Males versus females, it's not fair. Okay, if yours, you have different rulings because of the difference in creation, then we also, Islam also has. But when it comes to the purpose of creation, right there the verse says, I created you man and woman. I created you different tribes, different peoples, different branches of peoples, shu'ub, qaba'il, lita'arafu, so you get to know each other, you can identify each other. But, inna akramakum Allah atqaakum. The most high of you, the highest of you, a.k.a. the most spiritual of you, atqakum. The one who obeys me more. The one who has more taqwa. Taqwa means obedience of Allah. Taqwa, in other words, ubudiyya. Same thing. When you have taqwa, the result is ubudiyya. And servitude of Allah. Alright, so we're good. What are we doing? Once again, we're establishing the foundational principles first and then we're going to move into that topic. This is how scholarship, inshallah, is supposed to be done. This is how even in the houses it's done. You go to the Qur'an, you set the principles and then you use those to, inshallah, be able to determine different things and the details. Alright. So according to these verses, spirituality... The condition for it is ubudiyah. Spirituality equaled Allah, not those signs, although they might come, they might not come, whatever. Spirituality equals Allah, criteria, condition for spirituality, ubudiyah. What is the opposite of ubudiyah? Ma'siyah, disobedience of Allah. So, spirituality equals obedience. What hinders spirituality is Disobedience. Very simple. That's our principle. Now let's move on into the topic itself. Introduction. Two or three introductory points. When it comes to the effects of certain things, we have 
certain effects that are, they call them taqwini effects or wad'i effects. Which means this is the effect of it no matter what. If you drop something, it falls, right? Gravity pulls. Water makes wet. Whatever, whatever it is. Alcohol intoxicates. That's an athar wad'i, they call it. A, an effect, a set effect that will not change. All right. Question is, is one of the athar wad'iyyah, one of those effects that always will happen, is one of those effects of haram affecting the spirituality, no matter you, what, no matter you like it or not, no matter if it was done willingfully or not willingfully. If something in essence was haram, whether you knew it or not, it will have an effect on your spirituality because this is one of those wad'i effects, one of those set effects. The same way gravity pulls. Alcohol, for example, in and of itself taints the soul. This is the question. Taints the soul, a.k.a. affects the spirituality. So I'm just rephrasing this question to be more technical. When you want to shoot something down, know what you're shooting down. Rephrasing it so we know exactly what we're talking about here. Is spirituality being affected one of the athar wad'iyya of something that's haram? I'm going to use the example of alcohol. Or haram meat, for example. That's one introductory point. Rephrasing the question to make it more technical. Number two, another part of our question was if I commit a haram unwillingly, so we or I have a doubt in the ruling, if I'm not sure, if I make a mistake, let's dissect this now. Introductory point number two. Brothers and sisters, I want you to pay attention. Sometimes, you don't know whether or not you can drink this liquid because you don't know the ruling regarding water or alcohol or whatever. You don't know if lobster is halal or not. They put a lobster in front of you. Can I eat this? I don't know. I'm not sure. Because I don't know the ruling. I have a doubt. I have a shubha. It's called in the ruling itself. Whether the sharia allows this or doesn't allow this. I'm not even sure. I haven't done my homework in this regard. Ulama say, it is wajib on you to learn the rulings pertaining to your everyday life. It is wajib on you. If you're driving in the road, you pass the red light. The police officer pulls you over. He says, why did you uh, pass the red light? What do you say? You say, oh, I, I didn't know that that's one of the rules. He says, how would you get your driver's license? Please give me that first. And then I'll take your car to the pound. No. When you drive, the assumption is that you know the rules. If you're living on the face of this planet, Allah brought you here. You have a marja. And you know you have to follow the marja. That's not going to be an excuse that I didn't know the rules. There's hadith that on the day of judgment they say, why didn't you act? You say, I didn't know I have to act. They say, why didn't you learn? Not knowing is not an excuse. So this is one of those shubhat. Shubha, they call it shubha hukmiya. Regarding the hukum of something, the ruling on something. You don't know because you don't know the ruling. This has two parts to it. Sometimes you don't know because it's not your fault that you don't know. You didn't even think there was a ruling here. Or you knew that if this is the ruling, but you were wrong. You thought this is halal, it was haram. They call this qusur. It wasn't your fault. But sometimes there is taqseer. It is your fault. You knew there, might, there was a chance that there's a ruling here, but you said, I'm not going to, you know, laziness or whatever. All right, so, so far what do we have? 
you don't know the ruling, you don't, you don't know whether this is halal or haram because you don't know the ruling, sometimes it's your fault that you don't know and you can be held responsible, sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes you're mistaken, it's not your fault. All right. Now sometimes it's not the case. You know the ruling. I know that alcohol is haram. I know that the Ahlul Bayt have said one drop of it is haram. You don't, you're not supposed to get close to this junk. The only thing that sets the difference between us and animals is our intellect. Something goes to wipe out the intellect. All right, so you know the ruling. But I don't know, this drink that's in front of me right now, does it have alcohol in it or not? This is the question. Can I drink this because I'm not sure. Is there in there or not? This is a different kind of question and doubt. This is called shubha, they call it. Brothers, don't forget, and sisters, we're going to go back to Tawheed. All right? I'm just making my way down and then I'll con reconnect it, inshallah. I'm not sure, is this haram or not? Why? Don't you know alcohol is haram? I know alcohol is haram. If I don't know alcohol is haram, I might as well just pack my bags. I know it's haram. I don't know if this bottle in front of me is haram or not because it has alcohol or not. What am I supposed to do in these cases? Once again, there's different cases and scenarios in this regard. But usually, usually, the ruling of the maraja is that it's okay to have it. And this is where the whole question comes. I drank it and turns out that there was something haram in it. I knew meat that is not slaughtered properly, I cannot have it. I knew that. What was the ruling? You can, if, 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 if a Muslim tells you that this has been slaughtered properly, you don't have to investigate, you can eat it. You ate it, turns out that this one was, had not been slaughtered properly. Wa what do I do? Has my spirituality been affected or not? This is the question. In that first case where we have shubha hukmiya, I don't know if this is halal for me or not. Because I don't know the ruling. This lobster, I don't know, can I have it or not? Which, by the way, in parentheses, people ask, is lobster halal or not? Lobster, according to the majority, if not unanimously, is not halal, they say. I know you're going to hate me now, probably, some of you. The silence took over. Recite salawat. <laughs> if you don't know that it's halal or not, because you don't know the ruling, if they say all marajit say, you cannot have it until you make sure that it's halal. You don't know the ruling. It is wajib for you to do ihtiyat, practice precaution, not have it, and then go and do research. If it's halal, then bismillah. If not, no. And some people unfortunately do the opposite. They have it. And they say, if, it, if I ever find out that it is haram, I won't have it anymore. And they hold their ears too so they can never find out. That's not how it works. It's just like that police officer. He says, you have to go learn it. Assumption is when you have a driver's license, that you know it. So, sometimes you're not sure. Because of the ruling, they said you have to uh, practice precaution. But sometimes you know the ruling, it's in the application of that ruling that you're mistaken. And there they tell you it's halal. You eat it, you have it, it turns out it was haram. Question, will this affect my spirituality? You see how long it took just to find out what the question exactly is? We had to divide, separate, shubha hukmiya, mawdu'iyya, qasr, muqassr. And there's other divisions that I don't want to get into. I don't want to mix you up more. I think this serves our purpose so far. All right. Will it affect my spirituality now or not? What was spirituality? Allah. Okay. What was the condition for it? Disobedience and obedience. Let's look at this case specifically and dissect it. I was told 
by the marajah, through the Ahlul Bayt, the Sharia says that in Shubha Mawdu'iyya, where I am applying a ruling, if I am not sure if there is alcohol in this or not, for example, if this meat is haram or not, but I went through that means that the Sharia had determined, and I became sure that it's halal, and I had it, and it turned out to be haram. The question is, did I obey the ruling or disobey the ruling? The condition for spirituality was obedience and disobedience, right? We're just going to apply this principle that we learned through the Quran. When the marja tells me it's halal, it is, not, it is permissible to have something, you're not sure, did a drop of alcohol fall in it or not? The sharia, through the marja, he's saying, if that's the case and you're not sure and it's halal, it's halal for you and I have it, have I disobeyed the sharia or not? No, I haven't. Will it affect my spirituality? I don't care if I disobeyed or obeyed. Will it affect my spirituality? The whole purpose of this topic is to see whether it affects or not. We said spirituality is only affected through what? Obedience and disobedience. Ubudiyya, ma'siyya. Ta'a, obedience, ma'siyya, disobedience. Here, do we see any traces of disobedience or not? We don't see any traces. They told me it's halal, I had it. Turns out it was haram though. Did I disobey or not? What was the criteria? Disobedience was the criteria. Ma'siyah was the criteria. I don't see ma'siyah here. We have to do it again. Recite salawat. Move forward, brothers. <laughs> and sisters as well, please. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Back in the day when we were younger going to majalis, this is the part we hated, when they would tell you to move forward. You would come early to the majlis to you know, get that little spot where you're not crushed and, and, and trampled, but it would happen anyway. So why bother, you know, just come later, you know. Now this is the majlis of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, so why not? <sighs> Disobedience didn't happen, brothers and sisters. If there's no disobedience, what does that mean? That means there's no effect on spirituality. Very simple. Let me relate to you a story, a famous hadith regarding cheese. And I always use this example because it's very nice. They say someone came to one of the imams, I think it was Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he came to him, he's like, do you know He's huffing and puffing, you know, he's rushing to the imam. Did you know that there is some haram cheese circulating in the bazaar, in the market of the Muslims? Did you know? Some people, their spirituality is this, to make sure that haram cheese doesn't circulate in the, in the market. To make sure that if someone's shirt is a little bloody, for example, to make sure to tell them so that their prayer is, is, is right. The ruling is it's not wajib to tell them. And that person's salat will be accepted. We, we, we have to get to know our fiqh and our Islamic rulings a little better. It's easier than you think sometimes. A lot easier than we think. It's interesting how those things that Allah is very, very hassas about, very sensitive about, ah, we could care less. But then those things that Allah says, I could care less, oh, we're so sensitive about. It's vice versa. I could give examples, but I'll get in trouble. I don't want to do that. He comes to the imam huffing and puffing. There's haram cheese circulating for whatever reason in, in, amongst the people. So what, what? Right here, since all of you now, we've, we've been listening to these boring lectures for 10 nights now. What does your understanding right here, that, that, that precision that we inshallah gained, what does it tell you right here? He's coming and he's saying, haram cheese is circulating. That means he knows the ruling and how cheese can become haram, but he doesn't know 
what type of, which one of the cheeses out there is haram. All he does know is that there is some haram cheese circulating in the market of the Muslimin. He comes to the Imam. Oh Imam, this is this problem. And I'm going to add to it. He was probably saying, it has an effect on their spirituality on the people. The Imam... He says, oh, you, talk, you, you mentioned cheese. Or I like. You said something, you know, I like cheese, I like cheese. He tells his servant, go buy some cheese from the market. Oh, wait a minute. He's telling you that there's haram cheese out there. Oh, Imam, you have to say, really? Servant, make sure you don't buy cheese. Go find that cheese factory and burn it down. The Imam says, oh, you talked about cheese. Wait a second, hold your thought right there. Uh, servant, please go get some cheese, bring it back. So they, he gets cheese, he brings it back. He says, Bismillah, let's have some cheese. And they're having the cheese, and then after he's done, the Imam says, okay, so what were you saying? In other words, please, I mean, I taught you, you know, your lesson. But no, he asks, still he asks. Parentheses, brothers and sisters, sometimes religiosity, shaitan uses it. The places where you don't have to exercise too much obsession and was 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 was, you exercise it slowly, slowly. Before you know it, one or two years later, you're saying, "Oh Allah, what kind of religion is this?" Allah says, "What kind of person are you?" Huh? The problem isn't the religion. The problem is us and the way we understand it. We've we've, we've distanced from the ulama, and and, and true fiqh. As I said, I don't want to get in trouble. I'm not going to give examples. So the Imam tells him, he asks him, he says, Oh Imam, I was saying um, that there is haram cheese circulating in the market. The Imam said, he gave him an answer that there are some things out there. You know the ruling, but there, you don't know. When you're applying it, some of them might be haram, some might not be haram. You're not sure. Have what you want to have unless you become sure certainly that this is the haram that I knew was out there is in this one right here. Of course, this is a general rule. There's exceptions and so on. You have to go to, for fiqh uh, to see what fiqh says here. So this, this story is about shubha ghayr mahsura. This is like a fiqhi term. In shubha mahsura, you can't exercise this principle and so on. I don't want to get into it. If you have three glasses of water in front of you, you're 100% sure one of them has alcohol in it, you're supposed to stay away from all of it. That's shubha mahsura and so on. I don't want to get into that. Point being though, if it was going to get in the way of the spirituality, it would be haram. But the imam is saying it's halal. So does it read with our version of Tawheed, which we tried our best to get from Qur'an, and the justice of Allah, that He tells you it is halal for you to have this, but when you have it, He's like, yes, it hurts your spirituality. Got you. That doesn't read with the Tawheed that we were taught. Allah doesn't need it like that. If it was going to hurt our spirituality, Allah would say refrain. And in some cases, in some cases, where we know the ruling and in the application we're stuck, even there he says, I still want you to practice precaution. For example, for example, when it comes to umur muhimma, they say, important things, like someone's life being endangered. So you're saying, I've got this big boulder, I'm going to drop it off of the building. I know it's haram to kill people, but I don't know if there's someone understanding push it off when there's a chance of there being somebody. No, here you have to exercise precaution because it's something dangerous. But when it comes to normal things like cheese, Islam says, if I'm going to go all hard on the people, it will backfire. This concept of the Muslim market itself is something to look into. It's interesting. You get once you look into it and do research into it, you get the feel. You get a more of, more of an idea of how Allah looks at certain things. But there are some who want to be very extra religious. Now, I'm not encouraging to wherever we have doubt, go and do it, even if it's halal. No, sometimes it's good to do ihtiyat. It's good. But look at the point I'm trying to make in theory. Sometimes. Some people make it so hard on themselves and their families that when their kids grow up, they end up taking off the hijab completely. What kind of religion is this? The father or the mother went too hard on them. We don't eat meat. We haven't had meat for four months. Why? 
Because the Muslim butcher is here, they might not know what they're doing. The Muslim butcher here, he's not a very practicing, although he's saying it's halal, but he's not practicing. So there's a chance it might be haram. Mawlana, we don't want our spirituality to be affected. The ruling is that if he is Muslim, Muslim, finished, Muslim, he says it's slaughtered properly, you, you are sanctioned, you can go for it. But it might affect my spirituality. I don't know, we've been talking for 30 minutes now. That it doesn't. Spirituality equals Allah. Allah, the Quran says, if you want me, obedience. If you don't want me, disobedience. We don't see disobedience here. He's saying have it. If it makes sense, recite a salawat, please. And that is exactly what Ayatollah Bahjat means when he says sometimes ihtiyat is against ihtiyat. Ihtiyat is against ihtiyat. Precaution is against precaution. What does he mean? This obsession of precaution, precaution, precaution. All of a sudden you see you lost Islam altogether. Some of these precautions that are not necessary will cost you your deen. As I said, some people, they turn back after two years, they say, what kind of religion is this? Allah says, you have the problem, not the religion. The Prophet says, Bu'athu ala al-hanafiyyat al-samhat al-sahla. I was sent with the easy-going religion. We have enough hard harams out there. Why are we going to add more? So a question now rises. We've heard stories though. We've heard stories of greats who would stay away even from shubha. Even from those shubahat that you're saying are halal, they would stay away from. Some of those great urafa who had secured spirituality, all they could see in life was spirituality, all they could care for was spirituality, they would stay away even from shubha. So I'm going to stay away from shubha too. Answer. Answer. Do we stay away from shubha to become great? Or do the greats, when they reach higher levels, they do stay away from shubha? This is like the third time we've mixed things up, vice versa. A couple nights ago, we talk, there was other examples of this. This is itself is a fallacy and misunderstanding. Yes, whenever you become a great individual, then you stay away. Remember last night I said this, Ayatollah Musbah. He says that for some awliya Allah, you don't have five rulings anymore. You only have wajib and haram. I said this last night. Yes. For some greats, you don't become great like this. You become great through constant obedience of Allah. When you reach that level where you have to be a little more careful, you'll know it. Please, please keep these points in mind. These books that are out there on the stories of greats that talk about how this great, what did he do? He was in the cave he was on the, on, the, on the Mount of Khidr in Qom. Those of you who have been in Qom. He was on the Mount of Khidr in Ramadan time. Close to Iftar, he made his way down that mountain, made his way to the city. When he got home after one or two hours of walking with, while fasting, he saw that he had accidentally brought an ant with him to his home. There's, the story is there. What did he do? He walked all the way back and he put the ant there to punish himself as a kafara. That why didn't I pay attention so that I don't bring, this, bring an ant even with me and bother an ant as, in, as a kafara with that mouth, dry mouth fasting. He went back after iftar, put the ant there. Okay, so is this for me or is this for him? Brothers and sisters, the greats all say this is for him, not for me who's at the beginning. Has to still take care of ubudiyah in its first level. Taqwa, wajib and haram. You'll know when the time comes. Don't, we don't have to, we don't, we're, not, we're not supposed to try to act. Force it on ourselves. We reach greatness inshallah. The tears will come in our salat. Don't, you don't necessarily have to Forced tears. Of course, if they come, it's still good at this level that we're at. But some people think they have to force tears to come or else they don't grow in salat. No, Allah will take you higher when you pray. 
even if tears don't come, because he says there is obedience in this. And that verse that I recited, that key verse that I recited a few nights ago, when people make sacrifices, they sometimes, you see license plates in religious countries or Islamic countries, you see the, there's blood on, your, on the guy's license plate. Why? He sacrificed an animal so that Allah, you know, for that car. To make sure that Allah knows this, this car that you're supposed to protect, not someone else's car, smears that blood on the car. This goes back to something that was in Jahiliyyah. The Quran says that the, the, the meat of this animal, and I don't know, the blood of this animal doesn't reach me. The taqwa that you're exercising, the obedience that you're exercising with this, ex, with this sacrifice reaches me. That's what I'm after. Obedience. Because spirituality lies in it. You don't have to force the tears. Although if they come, it's good. Very good. When you go for ziyara, try to make tears come. It's good. But don't feel bad if it doesn't in your salat, the tears come. It's okay still. Do you have obedience or not? I had obedience. I didn't disobey Allah. Then you're good. I've seen Arafa. They come to them. They say, I missed my salat al-layl today. He says, have you committed haram in the daytime or not? Have you disobeyed Allah in the day or not? He said, no. He said, okay, you're good. You're good. You're good. Don't worry. Just try to make up for it. And the one, the one that you missed, if it's very important for you. But at the end of the day, obedience and disobedience is what counts. So those greats, those greats who would observe even these details, it's because they have taken care of the other 99% of Sharia. Now this 1%, they add it to become 100%. Some people are 0% and they spend 99% for, for 1%. It's like the person who is very, very overweight. His diet consists of, in the morning, pancakes, waffles, cream cheese, all the fattening stuff. Lunch, fast food, and a big Coke. Or Coke is, is, is Israeli, so we're not going to go towards Coke. We'll go something else. He's a good Muslim, though. His dinner, dessert, all that good stuff. So one day you see him, you're like, brother, I have a peanut butter sandwich. I want to give you half of it. He's like, oh, empty calories, bro. You're going to give me empty calories? You're like, what did you have two hours ago? Tell me that first. He's, going for the, he's staying away from the peanut butter sandwich, but all the other stuff, oh, sloppy, sloppy. We have to prioritize. We have to understand what counts. Build up from there. Yes, for some it has an effect, but for those elite it has an effect. Not for everybody. But we think that something special, something different we have to do than others. No. The difference between others and us, inshallah, is that we're going to practice what we know. Others don't practice what they know. Very simple. Others don't practice their taqwa. We're going to practice our taqwa, inshallah. Others' taqwa is sloppy. We're going to try our best to tidy that, that spiritual diet up that taqwa up that's what we're going to try to do and that's why I'm going to end with a quote from Allama Taba Tabai Rahmatullah Ali recite a salawat for his soul please I explained all of this he does it in like five lines or something he says they ask him a question that in these, as I said, these, uh, these uh, questions and uh, doubts regarding application of rulings, will it have an effect on our spirituality or not? If I eat something and then it turns out it was haram, will it have an effect? So, so far, it was me talking, an insignificant, humble, just how's a student. But let's go see what Allah Ta'ala says. And then you'll notice, you'll, you'll realize that I didn't say it out of my own pocket. Right? I was just explaining what they say, the greats, they, are, they have the connection with above. They say, okay, I'm going to give you what, you know, what, you know, the good stuff. But now the explanation of it, you can do that. Put, you know, think about it a little bit. The part that we can't do, these greats do, then it's upon us to try to explain more and more. Very simple. They ask him, if we, relying on the ruling that says it's halal to have something, you're not sure that there was something haram in it or not, like the alcohol that I said or like... The, the meat that I said and so on. 
If I was Islamically sanctioned and permitted to have something, I had it and it turns out to be haram, does that have a, an effect on my spirituality or not? Actually, in my notes, I had written the page of this book. And today when I was looking at it, I was like, uh-oh, I didn't put it there. So I actually contacted home. I contacted Qom. And I, sent text, I said, take a picture from page 424 and send it to me because I'm going to need this tonight. It's very important. I contacted Qom for this. Answer. He says, if a person acts according to his duty that the, is, the sharia has, uh, has, has, has determined for him. Based on and relying on, as again, once I said, once again I said, relying on that principle that, you know, if something you're not sure it was halal or not, and then you had it and, it was, and then it turns out to be haram, and, someone, and he consumes it, I'm just translating as I read it. He says, there will be no tainting of the heart and distance from the Lord. Because there's no disobedience here. Disobedience equals distance. That's all. That was the criteria, right? Why? He goes back to Tawheed. He says, because it is impossible for the lawmaker, which is Allah, who is all wise, to allow the, the consumption of something or the committing of something and doing of something that in reality will cause distance from him. If there is something that will cause distance from him, he has to determine it through the Sharia, through the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt. And distance from thawab and rewards. And it will not entail punishment or, he says, istihqaq al aqab. Look at this. These ulama, they know what they're talking about. He will not be deserving of punishment. Remember that point I said a few nights ago? Look at that. It's in there too or have any bad effect. And this is because, oh, this is because, don't you love him when ulama, the great ulama say something, you say, oh, I said the same thing. He says, this is because essentially the criteria for closeness, nearness to Allah and distance from Allah and the tainting of the soul and the lighting and radiance of the soul, what is the criteria? Is ita'a wa isyan. Obedience and disobedience, khalas, finished. Nothing else. So do you see how even understanding Tawheed, the way it's supposed to be understood, will help us when it comes to even these practical details of life and how we live our lives. You see? Tawheed spreads its wings everywhere, over everything, and drives and its roots in everything. Here, what's your reason that it's not going to have an effect on my spirituality? He says, because everything revolves around this. And if it revolves around this, Allah's wisdom will be questioned. Tawheed will have a problem. Inshallah, we will keep this in mind and practice. Where it is haram for sure, we will try our best. Our bodies will shake. And when there is, there is permission, we won't feel guilty about it. But the prerequisite to that is to learn what is haram and what is not haram. And I've said this every night almost. Inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum ya Alina al Akbar. Ya Sipta Amir al Mu'minin wa Fatima al Zahra. On the way to Karbala, Imam Hussein alayhi salam he saw a dream that a pack of wolves were tearing him to pieces. He woke up. He tells his dream. He sees Ali al Akbar. He tells Ali al Akbar, This caravan is going, death is coming with it. These children that you see that are happy running around, they have Abbas. They love Abbas. They're happy that I'm here. Death is following this caravan. 
there's not, there's not a good end to this story. He tells Ali al Akbar this. Ali al Akbar says, Oh Father, will we be on the straight path or not? That's what counts. He is the grandson of Amir al Mu'mineen. Amir al Mu'mineen, when the Prophet was giving that famous sermon before Ramadan started, Amir al Mu'mineen asked the question, the Prophet answered him, and then the Prophet began to cry. He said, Ya Ali, I, it's as if I see that your beard will be stained in this same month of Ramadan. What did Ali say? Did he ask, who's going to do it? What's going to happen? Please give me the details. He says, am I going to be on the straight path or not? That's all he asks. He doesn't care about anything else. The Prophet says, you'll be on the straight path. Ali and Al-Akbar is the grandson of this man. When the, when the Imam tells him, death is following like a shadow, this caravan, Ali and Al-Akbar doesn't say, really, what's going to happen? Ali and Al-Akbar says, are we on the right path when this happens or not? He says, yes. He says, إذن, لا نبالي بالموت. Who cares about maut? Who cares about death? This ma'rifa. It is not just Ali that has this. Qasim even had this. But they trampled his body. Everyone is in love with Ali and Al-Akbar. That's why when the companions, one after another, are slaughtered, the time comes for the holy family, the chosen family. Banu Hashim, Ahlu Baytin Nubuwa. Now it's time for you to defend. You're not supposed to do this, but it's either you or Abu Abdullah that has to go. Banu Hashim are going to go. Who's the first to go? Abu Abdullah wants to show the enemy that when it comes to Islam, I don't care, I send mine. Ali, it's Banu Hashim's turn. It's time to go. Hussein is not letting any doubt in him. His voice isn't shaking. Oh Ali, it's time to go. Go. But Abu Abdullah, if you're so strong, the women and children aren't. They say Ali al Akbar comes to the tent of the women and children. They surround him. Where are you going? Don't leave us. Ali al Akbar, you reminded us of the Prophet. I don't know. Maybe Abu Abdullah, every now and then, when he would miss his mother Fatima, he would sit back and look at Ali walk in the tent. He says, Ali reminds me of my mother because he is Ashbahun Nas. Rasulullah. He is the most similar to the Prophet. And they say the Prophet and Fatima were very similar. Maybe Abu Abdullah, he looks at, at, at Ali al-Akbar when he walks. He, reminds, he remembers his mother when she walks. It's as if Abu Abdullah and the women and children are sending Fatima to Zahra, to the battlefield. But Fatima did her job back in Medina. Anil Akbar, I want you to live up to Fatima. The women and children, they're crying. Ali, this beautiful moon has to go to the battlefield. He goes to the battlefield. Abu Abdullah, all of a sudden, he's not so strong. And when he's going, he doesn't even look back. Abu Abdullah holds his beard, looks to the sky. He says, Oh Allah, I am sending Ashbahu nas khalqan wa khulqan bi Rasulillah to the enemy. Oh Allah, you judge between me and these people. They have destroyed my heart with Akbar. But Ali doesn't even look back, he's going. They say, is it the Prophet that's coming to fight us? What's going on? It's there that he says, Ana Ali. My name is Ali. If you don't have an excuse to fight me because I look like the Prophet, my name is Ali. Now you have an excuse. He fights, he fights and fights. He, he, he sustains many small cuts and wounds. Brothers and sisters, in the hot plains of Karbala, when you sustain little wounds, you get very thirsty. People have been in the Iran-Saddam war. They tell you, I've heard this from them myself. They say, when something hits you and cuts a part of you off, you don't feel it. But when there's lots of small wounds and blood is leaving the body, you get very, very thirsty. Ya Allah. Each one of your chosen ones, how do you test them? 
Ali al Akbar sustains many wounds. They say blood is coming out of the links of his armor. He's very thirsty. He comes back to his father. He says, Oh, Father, I don't have any more energy. The heaviness and the weight of my armor has taken all energy from me. Al Atashu Qad Qatalani. Thirst is killing me, Father. The Father shows his tongue to him. He says, Oh, son, what can I do? If you're thirsty, look what they have done to the son of the daughter of the Prophet. Go, inshallah, you will be quenched soon. Go back to the battlefield. Ali goes back to the battlefield. He fights and fights. He kills many. Abbas didn't have this chance. At least Akbar had, had this chance. He fights, he kills many until a bad wound he sustains. They say blood comes from him. It comes onto him. He's knocked unconscious. He holds on to the neck of his horse. This horse is a war horse. When a war horse senses that its master is in danger, it goes back to the camp of its master. But the blood is covering the eyes of the horse. The horse doesn't know which way to go. It goes deep into the heart of the enemy. They open up room for this horse. Let the horse go. If we can't kill Hussein, we will kill the soul of Hussein. This, this horse goes, it thinks it's going in the right direction. When there's enough distance, they say an iron rod comes down onto the head of Akbar. Some say a spear is lodged into his chest. They pull him off the horse. They cut Akbar to pieces. Ya Abatai. Hussein darts from the tent. He reaches Akbar. This time it's different. Zainab even comes to the nephew. Abbas is protecting Zainab. Hussein is at the body of Akbar. There is no body left. They say Hussein puts his face on the face of Akbar. The enemy is cheering and clapping. <laughs> they say Hussein puts his face on his face so long that they think that Hussein has died. Hussein has died. Cheer even more. Hussein says, "Ala dunya ba'da this world holds no value for me after you, O oh my Ali. Ya Abbas, take Zainab back to the tent. Tell Banu Hashem to come. I can't carry the body of Akbar all alone. Tell them to come and collect the pieces of my son. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Al-Ali al-Azim. Wa sayalamu al-ladhina zalamu. Ayyamun qalabin yanqalibun.